Romans chapter 5. We've come to verse 5. Last week we saw the progression of maturity for the Christian. We saw that maturity begins with tribulation. That's the catalyst for Christian growth. No pain, no gain. And yet, the pressures that God allows into our life as a Christian do not crush us, they do not make us sad, but they make us exult in joy as we see God work in our lives, we see our faith grow, and we see proven character begin to develop. And this results in hope. Hope is a certainty about the future. The word hope in the Bible does not mean something less than certainty, but the word hope means to have a certainty about things God has promised for the future, and, to, and this causes us to live in the light of those certainties today. But God wants us to know something else this morning. He wants us to know the logic of his love. And God is so gracious because he's going to show us from pure human logic that he loves us beyond our comprehension. Let's read verse 5. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, when we read about the love of God being poured out within our hearts, I want you to know exactly what that phrase means, love of God. It doesn't mean that God has poured out some sort of ability to love him. That's true, but that's not what this is saying. Love of God here is what we would call a subjective genitive, which means this. The love God has for us has been poured out within our hearts. In other words, the God has poured out through the Holy Spirit he has given us the ability to comprehend, at least in part, the love that he has for us. And the word has been poured out here is in the perfect tense in the original Greek, which means he has poured it out into our hearts in the past with results that keep on continuously. He has poured out evidence of that love that he has for us within our hearts in the past, that is when we accepted Jesus as our Savior, and the impact of that keeps on showing us the love that he has for us. And he said, this is through the Holy Spirit who was given us, aorist tense, and this means the Holy Spirit was given to us once and for all. The Holy Spirit was given to us at a point of time, and we have the Holy Spirit, as Ephesians 4.30 says, until the day of redemption. That's when we get our resurrection bodies. And so the Holy Spirit present in our heart, has poured out within our hearts an understanding of the love that God has for us. But beginning with verse 6, the Holy Spirit begins to show us from the logic of what God has done how great that love is. Beginning with verse 6, we have an explanation of how we can understand God's love for us. It starts with for, which means it's going to explain, to, to spell out what that love God is, God has for us really is. Now, as we go through these verses, I want to give you some pegs to write down, okay? Some pegs that will help you understand this passage. We won't get through the whole passage through verse 21 today but we will get through part of it. All right, but here are some things, some memory pegs I want you to write down so that you can study this on your own this week. First of all, the logic of God's love, the logic of his love for us, 
is first substantiated by the kind of people that he shows us he died for. What kind of people did, did God love enough to die for? All right, look at verse 6a. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. So there are two words underlined there. Helpless and ungodly. All right, then in verse 8. But God demonstrates or literally proves his love, own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So underline the word sinner. That's the third description of the people he died for. Helpless, ungodly sinners. Verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Underline the word enemies. So four different descriptive words are used of the kind of people that God loved enough to die for. Helpless, ungodly, sinners, enemies. Would you die for people like that? Hey, listen, today I doubt if most people would be willing to die for anything. That's the problem with our society today. There's no cause, no person, nothing in our society today that most people would be willing to die for. They wouldn't die for freedom. They wouldn't die for liberty. Most people would sell out their friends. That's the kind of character in the world in general that we have today. Frankly, it's, it's usually only the Christian who really has true faith and has grown in his faith that would be willing to die for something. And yet God says, look, the logic of my love, if you want to know whether I love you or not, then the Holy Spirit that has been given to you will take these scriptures as you meditate upon them and say, look, you don't think I love you? I died for you when you were helpless, ungodly, a sinner, and my enemy. Now, the logic of love is this. If God loved you enough to die for you when you were in that condition, what will he do for you now that you are his child? Hmm? Well, he answers it in this passage five times what he'll do. Five times. And this ought to put forever put to flight those who say, that once you're truly born again, once you have accepted Christ and you've received forgiveness, that you can be lost again. To me, that's one of the most damnable false doctrines that anyone can teach, that once you're saved, you can be lost. If God loved you enough to die for you when you were helpless, ungodly, a sinner, and an enemy, and now you've received Jesus Christ, you've accepted the gift of forgiveness he offered, now you're his child, what will he do for you now? All right, look, and he'll tell you. Verse 9, much more. Verse 10, much more. Verse 15, much more. Verse 17, much more. Verse 20, all the more. You got it? You ought to hear a little joy out there. 
If God loved you enough to die for you when you were his enemy, is he going to do less for you now that you're his child? His answer is much more. You need to get that. It's something that is irrefutable. The logic of God's love goes beyond the logic of man. So let's take it up. Now remember, study those much mores. Five times God says, I will do much more now that you're my child. If I did the most for you when you were my enemy, I will certainly not do less when you're my child. That's the logic of God's love. Right, let's look then. Verse 6. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. What does it mean to be helpless? It means to be in a condition where you can do nothing to help yourself. See, what God wants us to know from the very beginning, he's already given us the, in the first part of Romans, he's given us the awesome, almost incomprehensible things he did to remove the barriers that stood between us and him. And he's, chapter 5 is concluding in the book of Romans the argument for salvation. How are we saved? By the work of God alone, he did it all. He's shown us categorically that there are only three ways of salvation. It's either a work of God for man, or a work of man for God, or a joint work of man and God. He shows us that it can only be one way, and it is a work of God for man. You, if you try to help God, then he can't help you because you only... The minute you start trying to help God save you or even keep you saved, what you do is put yourself on a merit basis and then God has to say, okay, the standard is perfection. If you want to help me save you, then you're on a merit system. Here's the law. Good luck. You've got to keep it without breaking it in any detail, ever. But chapter 5 is the transition it's showing the concluding arguments that God alone saved you and he saved you by grace, which means he provides everything, through faith, which means we simply receive that as a gift. And so these are the concluding arguments. When we finish chapter 5, we go into chapter 6, which begins God's teaching on how to live the Christian life as a saved person. But this is the transition. So when he says, while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, this means we could not do even one thing to help God save us. We were in such a totally depraved condition that we were helpless to help God in any detail save us. And the Holy Spirit wants to drive that deep into our hearts. That man can do nothing to help God save him. He can only receive the finished work that Jesus accomplished at the cross. And then he says, at the right time, Christ died for us, the ungodly. At the right time. Now, what does this mean? At the right time means that God had a timetable. All through the Old Testament, he predicted he was going to send a Savior. Sometimes he taught it by animal sacrifices, where he had a passion play in the wilderness, where divinely appointed animals died as innocent substitutes in the place of man for his sin. Sometimes that was the way God taught there was a coming Savior. Other times, like in Isaiah chapter 53, he predicted that there was coming a, his servant. That no one would recognize, he says, he will be despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, 
acquainted with grief, and we will hide, as it were, our faces from him. It says, yet he will be bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace shall be upon him, and by his stripes will be healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord shall lay on him the iniquity of us all. 750 years before Jesus was born, that was predicted of him. But Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 25, set up the meaning behind this at the right time because Daniel predicted the time that the Messiah would come. It would be exactly 483 years after a Persian king, Artaxerxes Langemanus, would give permission for the Jews to return from exile and to set up and rebuild the temple in the city of Jerusalem. He came at the right time. He came in those days. He would come and proclaim himself the prince at exactly the end of that 483 years. So the whole salvation plan was on a timetable. And God reminds us of that in passing here. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. What does it mean to be ungodly? What kind of a person do you think of when you think of someone who is ungodly? It means that they're unacceptable to God in any way. They're unlike God. And so he says that not only were we in a condition of helplessness, but we were totally unacceptable to God. We were unlike him, incompatible. This is why there had to be a separation between man and God because our sin had erected a barrier between us. And we were ungodly, could not even come close to a relationship with him. Then in verses 7 and 8, the logic of God's love is contrasted with human thinking, the human viewpoint. Verse 7, it says, For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. Now what's the point of this? Why is he saying this? Why is the point brought up that very few will die for someone. He wants to show the difference between the highest expression of human love and God's love. You know, Jesus said, greater love hath no man that he will lay down his life for his friend. That's the highest expression of human love that we would die for a friend. And it says, yet it's for a good man that someone might even dare to die. Can you think of someone you would die for? Well, a mother might die for his child or a father. You know, I heard of a case last week that happened in Galveston, Texas where this father leaped into the water to save his daughter who was having her leg ripped off by a shark. The man didn't give it a second thought. He leaped into the water and he held that shark by its dorsal fin and literally punched it until it let go of his daughter. Well, you see, love motivated him to do that. He didn't think of the fact that he could be torn to shreds too. The girl was saved. She lost a leg, but she was saved. It was the love of her father that motivated him to do that courageous act. But God has done something so far beyond that. I mean, sure, we might even dare to die for our child or for our wife or for our husband for a father, for a mother. But at least there is a reason behind it. There's a, there's a love there that is natural and can be explained. 
But God's love can't be explained. And that's why it says in verse 8, but God demonstrates. The word demonstrate means to prove in action. God proves in action his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you see the logic of his love? The word sinner, by the way, means to defiantly rebel against someone with scorn. It means to scorn someone and rebel against everything they stand for. That's the word hamartia that's used here. God proves his love in that while we were shaking our fist in his face, when we were going about our lives in defiance of him and from all eternity he knew that and when he hung on the cross he saw you and he saw your whole life before him he saw the kind of person you were he saw the kind of person you would be and he loved you so much that Jesus said father lay all of those sins upon me. And he took the punishment that was due you and then he died for you. Now, I don't know whether the Holy Spirit is on the same wavelength he, with you as he is with me right now, but that's absolutely incom incomprehensible. That the God who created the universe who is supreme above all, does not need to answer to anyone, that he would step out of glory into time, become a man, and be willing to take upon himself the rebellion and the sin and the guilt of those who wave their fist at him and to die for them, knowing that most of them for whom he was dying would never believe in him. But you see, Jesus Christ died for the ones that are going to hell as well as for the ones that are going to heaven. He paid for the sins of Genghis Khan. Lenin. Boy, that was a load. Stalin. Hitler. Mao Zedong. And those are only the most recent people. That's not even looking back into history very far. But Jesus died for their sins as well as for ours. Knowing that many would die with, with their last breath, they would wave their fist in his face. And yet he died for them. Herein is love. Not that we love God but that he first loved us and gave his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Remember your verse for memory? He proved his love toward us and that while we were in that condition, he was willing to die for us. And so it goes on. In verse 9, this is the first of the much mores. Much more than. This is the much more, much more than justification. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Now let's get into the logic that God is throwing us here. What can be much more than being justified by the blood of Christ? That's what he's saying. Much more than having now been justified. In fact, he says that justification is a fact already. He says there's something much more beyond being justified by the blood of his son. What does it mean to be justified? Well, some of you weren't here when we went through chapter 3, so I'll capsulize it this way 
To be justified means to be declared as righteous as God. It doesn't mean to be made just as if you never sinned. That would make you a zero. It means to be made just as if you always did everything as right as God does. That's what it means to be justified. Now, what in, what in heaven could be greater and much more than that? He says there's something much more he has for us than that. To take me, a rebellious sinner, and to declare me as righteous as God is, and then he says there's something much more, and he reminds me that I was declared that way by the blood of his own son. But he says it is much more because he says, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Now here's where I have to take great exception with everyone, no matter who they are, no matter how popular a TV evangelist they may be, who says that once a person is a child of God, he can be lost. How can anyone understand this verse and say a thing like that? If you've been declared as righteous as God is by the blood of his son, he says then much more you will be saved from the wrath of God through him. The wrath of God is a reference to the last judgment. A time when every person who has refused to receive the gift of forgiveness Christ died to give them will stand. If you've believed in Christ, you won't stand at the last judgment. Only unbelievers stand there. And he says, how much more will Christ save us from that judgment if he was willing to declare us righteous at the cost of his own blood? It shows that we are eternally secure from the wrath of God. Because God poured that wrath out on Jesus in your place when he hung on the cross for us. Now, it says, having, uh, we shall be saved from the wrath of God, how? Through something we do? No, through him. Now, verse 10, the logic of love goes on. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be delivered daily by his life. That's the way that should be translated. We shall be delivered daily by his his life but let's see what it says when it uh, let's see what it really means here what does it mean to be reconciled if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his son to reconcile someone the word that is used in the Bible shows that God was never reconciled to man. He didn't need to be. It's man who is reconciled to God. And this means to restore someone to relationship through the removal of all barriers. Reconciliation means to remove barriers and return to a relationship. So what it's saying here is if while we were enemies... God removed every barrier that stood between us and him through Jesus Christ. Through the death of his son. Then if he loved us enough to do that, much more than having been reconciled, we shall be delivered daily by his life. Now what does that mean? 
we should be delivered daily. It means that every day Jesus Christ intercedes for us and secures us in the family of God. Hold your place here and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, where this is enlarged upon. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Hence also he is able to save until you blow it. Is that what it says? Hence also he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. How long am I saved? As long as Christ is alive. And how long is that? Forever. You see, he ever lives for the purpose of what? To make intercession for us. And if, he reckon, if while we were enemies, he loved us enough to tear down every barrier that our sin erected between us and God, if he loved us enough to do that through his death, then what is he going to do for us now that we're his children? He's going to deliver us daily. He is going to intercede for us daily before the throne of God. He delivers us from the wrath of God forever. Now you see, when something is taught line by line, verse by verse, in the scripture and it's clear then don't let someone come along with some obscure verse out of context and say what about this I call them the yes butters yes but the scripture clearly teaches that your Christian life is to be built upon love and thanksgiving for what God has already done. And that's why does God take so much time, now back to Romans 5, why does he take so much time and space to logically demonstrate to us how much he loves us and how that that love will never end and it will never let go of us, he'll never let us be lost. Why does he do that? because he wants the Holy Spirit who has been given to us to pour out within our heart a realization of how great that love is so that that will give us the correct motivation to live for him because you see out of that comes the only correct motivation to live for God and yet so many ministers today and Bible teachers try to create a motivation to live for God out of something that's diametrically opposite from what God says we should have. You know what that is? Fear. Fear. Scare the hell out of them and keep them in line. But you see, God says that's going to earn wood, hay, and stubble at the judgment seat of Christ. And many are going to see their whole life of works for God go up in smoke because they did them with the wrong motivation. But then the yes butters say, yes but. What about Philippians chapter 2? Let's look at it. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, this was an ancient metaphor or it was a 
It was a symbol of working with reverence and sincerity. It did not mean to be scared of. Fear was a term of respect and awe, not of fright. And so this is not telling us to work out our salvation in, in, in uh, fright and being scared all the time. But it means to work out our salvation with respect. But what does it mean to work out? The word katergodzomai is the original word translated to work out. This is a word which means, now listen to me carefully, it means to work to the outside something that's already on the inside. And so what it is saying is work to the outside the salvation that's already on the inside. Now, katagodzomai is backed up by the next verse, verse 13. For, now remember, this is explaining the last verse. For it is God who? It's God who is at work where? In you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, you see, what God wants is for us to let come to the outside what he's working on the inside. And that's what it means to walk in the Spirit, because when you moment by moment depend upon the Holy Spirit who dwells within you, it is God who causes you to will and to do his good pleasure. Now, if it's God who's causing you to will and to do his good pleasure, who gets the glory when you do something? God, not you. Then you can't stand up in a meeting and give a testimony about everything you've given up. I used to go to meetings in the South where these things were popular a certain large southern denomination. And I learned as a young believer that if you were really spiritual, there were certain things you did. And one of them was that you got up and gave a testimony about what you'd given up. And I watched carefully. I wanted to be accepted. So I watched carefully as people would get up and they would they would really work at looking humble and they'd talk about how they'd given up beer. <laughs> and another one get up and, and they'd you'd talk about how he'd given up smoking. Well, there's nothing wrong with getting rid of some of that junk. One person said smoking won't send you to hell. It'll just send you there earlier and make you smell like it. No, the Christian won't go there. But I learned that, hey, if you really wanted to be spiritual, you got up, and man, I learned to sort of kick my toe into the carpet and lower my head like this and get a humble look and talk about things I'd given up. But you know something? When you do that, what happens is a worse sin comes in, and that's pride. And so what this verse is saying is, look, with fear and trembling, meaning with respect and an earnestness, work to the outside what God has already put on the inside. For it is God who is at work within you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. And that happens when we stop trying to save ourselves. We try, stop trying to work out a fear, guilt, and obligation to keep ourselves safe. And we realize, hey, God loved me so much when I was his enemy that he died for me. What's he going to do for me now? Much more. Man, let's get with the program. Let's do something. Then you start depending on the Holy Spirit who dwells within you. And the Holy Spirit starts using what you've got and more more so, and he starts doing all kinds of wonderful things through you. He causes you to want to serve God 
Because if God loved you that much, you want to love him back. But it must be with proper motive. That's why Romans 5 is the logical transition between what God has done to save us into what we can do as a saved person in Romans 6 and fall. And so it is so terribly important to get this. Now let's turn back where it says in verse 11, and not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The word exult means to leap for joy. Exult means to leap. And the idea is we leap for joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received the reconciliation. This means we have now received a standing before God that is absolutely secure because the Lord Jesus Christ through his death tore down every barrier that could have ever separated us between the, the, the God and us and he has removed it forever. The moment we believe that Jesus Christ did that for us, that reconciliation becomes permanent. And we can leap for joy because we know that it's a finished work. But now there is a transition beginning with verse 12 in chapter 5. Because this is still talking about the certainty of salvation, but it begins to make a, a, a transition of how God is working with the one who believes in Christ. Whereas before everything God had to give us was given in chapters 1 through 4 on the basis of a divine declaration a divine fiat, a divine statement that cannot be reversed. But beginning with verse 12 and going through chapter 8, the emphasis changes from what God declares to be true of us to union with Christ and what that union with Christ makes true for us. No longer is it simply a declaration of a fact but now it is something that becomes absolutely ours because of who we're in union with. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about this. I'm sure this is a new concept to you. And frankly, some of you will not, most of you may not get what I'm talking about this morning. You will later if you don't get it this morning. But I'm praying that all of you will get it. The, the absolutely phenomenal, amazing fact of union with Christ and what becomes immediately, irrevocably ours because of that union. And God leads Paul the Apostle to develop this in the most extraordinary way. He contrasts our union with Adam with our union with Christ. Now, you know, we're, we were all born in union with Adam. Now, there were certain things that were undeniably true of us before we did anything. They were undeniably true of us simply because we are related to and in union with Adam, the first man. Now, he takes the awful things, actually, that were true of us because of that union with Adam and the certainty of those things being true. He takes and he contrasts that with what has now become true of us because we've been taken out of the union with Adam and placed in union with Christ. And he shows just as death was certain because of our union with Adam, so life is now certain because we're in union with Christ. Just as we were under condemnation because we were in union with Adam, now we have eternal life and the righteousness of God because we're in union with Christ. We didn't do anything to earn the death and, and condemnation in Adam, did we? We had that from the beginning. We'll see that in a moment. It's here. It's all here.